Good morning, it's Tyler here at Fit Waco, checking in team number 1477, Texas Tour. This team, by the way, this year, absolutely phenomenal looking machine. We got to talk about everything that goes into this. A great wide intake. I love wide intakes, uh, especially this year. Spindexer uh, for the Conan Cube, a really cool transfer system as we follow up in the arm. And look at it right here. Maybe a buddy climber, something like that. We'll see. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more what goes into this type of climber as well, too. And can't wait to talk more about 1477 and all about the robot coming up here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. If your team is using SOLIDWORKS, make sure you log into the 3D Experience platform to gain access to tutorials, collaborate with other users, and download the charge up field and kit up parts. Go to SOLIDWORKS.com first and click on Log into 3D Experience platform to gain access. The Charge Up competition season is here. We have a ton of live Twitch and YouTube content coming to you. All of our uploads and archives, including shows, behind the bumpers, analysis, and more, are available at youtube.com slash first updates now. Check out all of our live shows on Mondays and Tuesdays at twitch.tv slash first updates now. Max, let's start out talking about the uh, ground intake on your robot here. You guys have a uh, super wide intake. I love that. Uh, with some huge wheels as well, too, and a little bit of custom work uh, back yeah. behind that. So a big, uh, big uh, motivation for us this year was just being able to intake pieces as well as possible because we knew that that was going to be a really important element of the game. So this intake allows us to pick up cones and cubes from any orientation. Um, and it, we use uh, three sets of four-inch wheels, uh, two on the top, and then one versa roller as well on the bottom. And uh, the star wheels here allow us to transfer a lot better into the spin dexter. And it was, it was a big challenge getting the packaging in uh, to fit inside such a tight space because we have to fit around the climb and the elevator. So what allowed us to achieve that was a four bar linkage on the uh, top rollers connected to the bottom rollers through another linkage. So that complicated mechanism allows us to fold the intake up inside the bot and then deploy it to the perfect, perfect, to the perfect position. Um, we run two Neos on the pivot uh, to pivot the intake down. And then we have one Neo on top for the uh, rollers and then a 550 on the bottom. When you guys were experimenting with uh, different types of wheels for intakes, that sort of thing, how'd you come up with uh, these in particular? So through prototyping, we just found that the uh, four-inch wheels really grip the game pieces very well, especially these ones from Bex, and uh, as well as Star Wheels, just really help in uh, kind of transferring the cube in or and the, the cone in uh, from like whatever position it may come into the spindex really well. I, I love it so much, and looking at this year's game, I think a lot of teams are underestimating having that super wide intake. I love that your team uh, went that route and could talk uh, more about why you went that way as well too. That kind of moves us into the spin decks here. Preston's going to talk about uh, how that process worked. Uh, we didn't, we haven't seen too many teams do spin decks here. Yeah, I've seen a couple out there so far, so I'd love to hear about why the spin decks route was the right way for Texas Torque. So we knew the intake needed a buddy, and that buddy is the spin dexer. Basically, it's controlled by a Neo 550 that's hooked up to a 10 DP gear, um, both of these gears. The 150 one that is the larger center gear, because that whole turntable is a gear. And then there's a 10 DP gear that's on a reduction um, that's also machined in-house um, that turns the entire mechanism. Um, so we went this route as this was the fastest and also the most simplest version possible to orient the cubes. Um, we knew that a wrist design would be a lot heavier and um, also it would, be, it would raise our CG a lot. And we had, we had CG issues last year, so we really wanted to avoid that. Um, so the cube, the cone is picked up from the claw in the position like this and it grabs it and just swings it up. One of the things uh, when I watched your first match too is not just from the intake, but you guys were also doing a lot of the uh, collection from the uh, station as well too. That seems so smooth for your team. Uh, were you looking at all your testing that you did? Uh, how did you come up with uh, just that little ramp there? Because it seems to work so well. Yeah, so we call it exactly like you said, the ramp. Um, we knew that we wanted, in case we have a backup where our intake fails, that we have a ramp or possibly like you know something sloped to where we can basically just run up to the driver station, the driver station, the driver, the human player drops the cone in, slides in, the operator orients the cone, and then we just go up and grab it. It makes our cycles much faster, and it gives us a safe route in case our intake fails. One, one of the things too on your um, cone versus cube, the, the cube looks like overall, like you pretty much pick that up from any configuration, but the cone-wise, uh, you kind of have to get in a certain spot, right, for your claw. So is that actually orienting while you're driving the other side of the field, or do you have to orientate first? Can that happen on the fly? So we can, it's all up to our driver and what they're feeling basically. Okay. Um, typically we'd like to intake cubes from the side, but we are, during our testing, we picked up cubes, um, or cones, sorry, 
from any orientation, and that was the main goal of the intake. So about orienting right now, that's a manual process that right is, now, but I think talking to you earlier, so you're looking at iterating that in future events, Yes, right? I'm sure Justice will pick up on more automation later, but yes, we have plans in the future to automate this process. That as we looked at going into the uh, claw and the arm and the elevator here, I'd love to hear more about that transfer process, how that works on your team, uh, and then if we can, of course, showcase that elevator happening too, it'd be great. Yeah, of course. So off of the Spindexer, the next subsystem that picks up from the Spindexer is our claw right here. So this claw is pretty simple. It's two polycarbonate uh, flanges that are powered by a Neo 550, which allows it to open in, uh, like uh, allows it to open and close. Um, so the claw comes down and picks up the game piece from the Spindexer, and we have surgical tubing on the claws themselves to help the game piece from staying in the claw while we rotate the arm up and out. So now, if you come around the backside, we can see our main scoring system. So for our scoring system, we have a two-stage elevator. And on the end of the elevator, we have a pivoting arm. So this is our two-stage elevator over here. The main, it's at a 45 degree angle. And the main purpose is to get this arm to an optimal location where it can score the game piece. Now, the actual arm itself is powered by a Neo that's located right here. And it's belted all the way up. The arm can spin 360 degrees. And it essentially gets the uh, game piece from the spindexer to the scoring location. Can we see so, the whole process of that coming yeah, through? Yeah, for sure. So we're going to feed a cone in right now. It's going to spindex, and we'll pick up the game piece from the claw. So you can see by combining our arm and elevator, we're allowed to get we're able to get the end effector from the indexing position to the scoring position in a very fast amount of time. Yeah, and okay, watching that, that wrist just kind of flip and go, it just seems like you're able to maintain that so well. How, has your team had any issues in regards to like maintaining grip on game pieces at all? And if so, how have you tried to mitigate that? So from our initial testing, we, we didn't have the surgical tubing and we had issues of the game piece falling out due to the rotational inertia of the arm. So we ended up having to add this gripping material so we can keep a good grip on the game piece as it flings out. Makes sense on there. Uh, Abhishek, I got to ask you uh, in regards to uh, you your team is doing custom swerve. Uh, I love to hear about teams and their experiences for that, especially any advice they might have for teams. Uh, and then as well, too, we're going to be talking about these awesome uh, fork prongs on your robot and maybe uh, hearing a little bit more if we're going to see something like this in action, too. For sure. So this is the first year we're uh, running these swerve modules. This is a custom swerve module that we designed over the off season. Uh, this is the second year that Texas Torque has actually run custom swerve modules in uh, competition. This swerve module design it features uh, two Neos, one on rotation, one on drive, and uh, an absolute encoder. And the Neos on this one are flipped to lower our center of gravity. This is pretty similar to the West Coast products, uh, Swerve X and the SDS Mark IV-I sure. designs. But uh, this is uh, designed so that we can machine it with our capabilities. We uh, mostly machine this on an Omeo X8, a Tormach, and a uh, manual lathe. So you're pretty well kitted out for uh, for making your own swerve then, huh? So Yeah. Very cool. Um, so you guys have been doing custom swerve for a couple of years now. What advice do you maybe have for teams who are looking at getting into swerve for the first time? I'd say if you're getting into swerve for the first time, I would definitely go with one of the COTS options, just because we did run into a lot of challenges with designing our own swerve. It's not an easy thing to do. It's a very complex subsystem. But the reason that we like to do that is it gives our students and our mentors a lot more experience yeah. with uh, uh, designing and on the manufacturing side. We got to check out these uh, awesome uh, forks, prongs. I don't know what you call them on your row up, but I'm so excited to talk more about uh, the buddy climb aspect. Uh, I'd love to hear kind of how that works and we can see a demo of that too. And uh, you got to tell me if we're going to see it at this event as well. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, beginning of the season, one of the first things we realized was we're going to need to climb very, really fast and get a triple climb. Uh, and the best way to do that, we thought, was to hang off the side of the charge station using an alliance row up. So, uh, do you want to pivot it down? So the way this works is we have a 300 to 1 gearbox down here powered by a single Neo, and uh, that's just a 35 chain. The pivot is made out of the Rev Max spline, and that we found was able to handle the torque that was required for this application. And these are PLA 3D printed plugs uh, that go into the carbon fiber. And you can see the bolt head sticking out right here. That's a 3816 bolt going all the way through the plug and holds it under compression, and that's what actually takes that load. And yeah, this is just 12 wrap carbon fiber that's epoxied onto the plug. And we have these little spearheads. These actually uh, wedge themselves under the Alliance robot. And what will happen is while the Alliance robot is engaged on the engaged and docked on the charge station, we'll pivot our climb our yeah, we'll pivot the forks up and the whole robot will pivot itself off the charge station and just barely clear the ground. Like I know it's based on the, the weight of the other robot. What kind of what angle does your robot get at for something like that? We try to go for a 45 degree angle. Okay. And the weight of the other robot in our testing, uh, we were able to do it with without the intake on this robot. So that's about 20 pounds lighter uh, with our everybot. So our team also builds an everybot to 
engage our rookies and uh, get more experience for them. And our every bout without a claw or any ballots, so I'd say it's about 50 pounds. Yeah. This bout was around 95 pounds. We were able to climb successfully. So. I got, I got to ask you, are we going to see this at, at Waco here, or is this maybe a future event for you? Uh, we're going to try it at Waco. We haven't run any quals yet because the risk of potentially falling and sure. messing up our quals. But, yeah, we'll definitely uh, be doing it on the practice field before our playoffs. I can't wait to potentially see that happen as well, too. How exciting to uh, hear more about that, and what a cool uh, feature for your team as well. Uh, just as we wrap up uh, on your team here, talking about uh, some of your custom camera work uh, that you're doing, and I know you guys are using Path Planner, too. Tell me a little bit more about yeah, that. Yeah, so consistent with our philosophy of building a lot of things in-house, we built our own alternative to the limelight called the Torque Vision. So if you want to open that up, it's based off a Raspberry Pi connected to a snake eye lens from Burning With Fusion, or something like that. Um, Playing with Fusion, I think, right? Playing with Fusion, that's right. Um, and then we run Photon Vision on that. Uh, our team is a contributor to Photon Vision. We're, we wrote the um, Photon Pose Estimator class, which we use to inversely uh, determine our position relative to April tags on the field. Um, we couple that odometry in the, um, with the cameras with our use of Path Planner, which we're also contributors to. We use Path Planner to um, uh, move a robot during autos and then we couple the path planner events with the state machine that controls the arms in order to score additional game pieces during auto and then do the level. Do you have any uh, path planner plans you can show us on computer? I do. So we split all of our path planner plans into uh, sub paths here. Um, that allows us to troubleshoot easier and then we have less points that we have to change. Um, so we're able to run these paths at our uh, full swerve speed and then uh, coupling our, our coupling that with our cameras, um, we're able to run at full speed without losing odometry too bad to slippage. Um, as far as additional features and software, one of our future goals is to automate the, um, the spin dexer using either sensors or a camera using masking to determine the shape of the cone. We also uh, are already working on features to do the auto line similar to Wild Stangs or Spectrum. Sure. Um, that uses the Torque Visions as well. We just haven't got that reliable for Waco yet. Um, and automating the fork climb as well so we can have a trapezoid profile so we don't sort of slam ourselves into the other robot. Well, Texas Torque, uh, absolutely phenomenal machine here, by the way. I watched your first match that you played. You look great, so I can't wait to see continued improvements from this team, uh, especially this whole Spindexer transfer and, of course, the Forks. Love to hear more about the vision that you did as well, too. So thank you so much for telling us about your team. And, of course, good luck here at Waco and throughout the rest of the season. Thanks a lot. Thank you. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. If your team is using SOLIDWORKS, make sure you log into the 3D Experience platform to gain access to tutorials, collaborate with other users, and download the charge up field and kit up parts. Go to SOLIDWORKS.com first and click on Log into 3D Experience platform to gain access. The Charge Up competition season is here. We have a ton of live Twitch and YouTube content coming to you. All of our uploads and archives, including shows, behind the bumpers, finalysis, and more, are available at youtube.com slash firstupdatesnow. Check out all of our live shows on Mondays and Tuesdays at twitch.tv slash firstupdatesnow. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.